Welcome everyone to the Heidelberg Engineering Academy. Thank you for joining our course, Optimal Techniques for Optic Nerve Head Imaging with the HRT. My name is Eva Kroniker. I'm a corporate certified ophthalmic assistant and clinical research coordinator. I've been in the field of ophthalmology since 1987, and I'm presently a product specialist in the medical education department here at Heidelberg Engineering, and I'll be your presenter today. In our course, I'm going to briefly discuss the technology of the Heidelberg Retina Tomograph, and specifically the glaucoma module. We're going to discuss image acquisition and image quality. And then I'll give you some valuable resources at the end of the course. And of course, we'll have our question and answer session at the end. But if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to ask at any time. All right, let's get started and talk about the HRT technology. The Heidelberg Retina Tomograph, or HRT, is a confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope. And sometimes you may hear it referred to as the CSLO. It provides the acquisition and analysis of two-dimensional images of the posterior segment, or the optic nerve head. It allows us to do quantitative measurement and assessment of the topography of the optic nerve head. And the HRT technology with TrueTrack image alignment also allows for monitoring for the presence of or progression of glaucoma. So what is a confocal scanning laser system? Well, first, it's a very focused laser beam as opposed to white light, which scatters. So it does sequential scanning in two dimensions, first point by point, and then, any, and then the confocal pinhole suppress any out-of-focus light. And I'm going to describe that CSLO technology in depth in just a moment. So this gives us very high depth resolution and allows us to measure the topography of the back of the eye. And it shows three-dimensional topographic images. The HRT has a laser source of 670 nanometers. It's a FDA class one laser with actually less light than a laser pointer. So it's very safe. Our field of view is 15 by 15 degrees, or 4 by 4 millimeters. The focal range for sphere is minus 12 to plus 12 diopters. We can correct for cylinder from minus 6 to plus 6 diopters. All right, now let's explore the CSLO system in depth. Once you take an image, in fact, this is what the camera head looks like. Once you take that image, the laser beam comes out of the laser and goes through the first set of confocal pinholes through the beam splitter and then it focuses on the back of the eye. And once the laser finds the back of the eye, you as operators are the most important. You're actually telling the laser and the software where to focus on the back of the eye. And then once the laser finds the back of the optic nerve head, the laser reflects back and comes through the second set of pinholes and then all this data is collected by the photo detector. And the beauty of the HRT is that any out-of-focus light or light that's coming from a focal point that we are not interested in, is it's sent back, but it's suppressed at these second set of confocal pinholes. Therefore, we're only gathering information where we intended to gather information. We're not being distracted by noise. So as it scans, it does this two-dimensional imaging. And it'll take all these two-dimensional segments layer by layer through the back of the optic nerve head. And this procedure is known as laser scanning tomography. So what does this mean? Well, if we were to lay all the two-dimensional scans out right next to each other, what you'd see is, in the beginning, the cup is a bit dark. And then you'd see it brighten up as the laser light finds the back of the optic nerve head. And then as the light fades out, that's the light coming back towards the camera. So now, what does the HRT software do? Well, it's going to acquire that three different times. The first time it scans through the back of the optic nerve head, it's going to take 64 of those two-dimensional sections. And then it will take two more images after that and set it to the correct depth. It's actually taking three to five images and keeping the best three. And one thing about setting to the correct depth and what I mean by that, 
let's say there's a patient who has a really shallow optic nerve head, only two millimeters deep. The very first image it goes through, it takes 64 of those 2D scans at four millimeters, and then it'll detect that this patient is actually two millimeters. So then the second and third image will automatically be set to two millimeters as opposed to four. Now, once the three images are acquired, it computes the topography from that raw data. And then it takes the three topography images and creates one mean topography image. So as you can see, there are a lot of data points being collected across that mean topography. And that really helps us to weed out poor quality data and allows us to calculate and measure the quality of the image. Now, here we show false color coding. The topography image itself is color coded with tissue that's more prominent being deeper darker orange, while the areas of either tissue loss or depressed areas, such as the cup, will show up with the brighter white colors. So if you took one of those two-dimensional images across the entire field of view, this is what you'd see. The retina is that darker orange color, and the cup here in this topography image shows up as a little bit brighter. And we do the exact same thing with the reflectance image. With this four by four millimeter view of the topography, we know the depth of each single point, and we also know how much light was reflected off. And this, again, is false color coding, and probably the image that you're most used to seeing and drawing your contour lines on. All right, so now on to image acquisition. The first thing to do, of course, is set up a new patient. And remember, with our HIEX software, you have multiple options to select each element. You can either click on the person facing forward or go to record and select new patient. For a follow-up examination, select the sideways person for new examination, or you can simply right-click on their name and select new examination. Just go with what you feel most confident in. Now, the first box is patient data, and this will always pop up. Of course, your most important fields are last name, first name, date of birth, gender, and we do have ancestry options. Currently, we have Caucasian, African, and Indian, and some people have asked if we will have Asian and Hispanic databases available. We hope to soon, and we'll certainly keep all of you updated if and when that's available. Now, the next box that's going to come up is your examination data box. And this is where you're going to select your appropriate device type, whether you have glaucoma, retina, or cornea. You want to enter in your operator initials. And this box is if you have studies going on or perhaps you have different diagnosis. You can click on this and filter it out at a different, different time. And this is your patient eye data window, and this will always pop up, and these are really important. But one thing to mention, if you've ever wondered what this More tab is for, if you click on More, it'll bring up this window where you can enter information such as pupil size, intraocular pressure, visual field information, and then just click less to minimize this window. Now, the reason I said this is important, corneal curvature. And I know a lot of people weren't informed about this information, but it's crucial to enter corneal curvature. And we'll go over why in just a moment, why it's so important. Of course, here you want to enter the information as it's entered in the patient's chart. You're going to enter the sphere, cylinder, and axis. And if the patient has astigmatism greater than one diopter, you'll see a warning message telling you astigmatic correction, highly recommended. So you have one of three options. You can either use the astigmatic lenses we provided, the patient's own glasses, or contact lenses. So to further elaborate on the corneal curvature, what is corneal curvature or your K value? Well, as most of you know, you take your horizontal and vertical keratometry measurements, add it together, divide it by two, and convert it to millimeters. And most of you have a contact lens department where they will have a millimeter conversion chart. If not, you can certainly access one online or give me a call. I can provide one for you. And the thing about our corneal curvature is it's combined with focus information to correct for magnification, so it's really important. 
we do have a default value of 7.7, .7, and if you really can't get the Ks, you can use the default. And the only time you need to change it is if your patient has had some type of invasive eye surgery or something that would affect that corneal curvature. You can modify or edit at any time. But if you do, you want to make sure to recalculate your topographies and update your patient chart with the correct information. So let's just talk about what happens if we left that 7.7 .7 in there when this patient was really 7.1. And it may be hard to tell on the screen, but these are actually at different magnifications. So let's just take cup shape measure, for example. As you can see here, the corneal curvature of 7.1, which this patient really was, they had a cup shape measure of minus 0.136. Well, what if you had left the default at 7.7? .7? It would have been at 0.124. Is that a big deal? Well, it's only a 0.012 difference. However, that's almost a 9% difference. So it can change those parameters up to 9 to 10%, which is really significant. So if you're not, if you're not entering those Ks and you leave that 7.7 .7 in there, but for example, let's say they're 8.4, you can make a patient who's within normal limits actually look glaucomatous. Or even worse yet, you can make a person who has glaucomatous values look to be within normal limits. So again, corneal curvature is crucial at baseline. It really does affect the data. It's just very important that you make it part of your protocol that all new patients have corneal curvature entered at baseline. But remember, if you haven't been doing it, you can modify it at any time once your patients come in. And then once it's in there, it'll be saved for all your subsequent exams. All right, so the next thing to enter is your patient's manifest refraction, as we mentioned earlier. And that, again, is sphere, cylinder, and axis. Now, if you have a patient that comes in and they're plano or they only have a quarter diopter sphere or half cylinder, go ahead and press OK and proceed with imaging. But if the patient does have cylinder greater than one diopter, please correct for it. As I mentioned, you will see that warning message telling you astigmatic lens is highly recommended. So if you've ever tried to image with the patient's own glasses, then you know it's really challenging due to that panoscopic tilt and reflection from the lenses. It's almost impossible to, to get a good clear image through glasses. So we recommend using our astigmatic lenses that came with your system or the patient's own contact lenses. One thing to mention, if you do use the patient's contact lenses, make sure to indicate whether you used gas permeable or soft lenses. And most importantly, keep your patient's corneas really well hydrated, and you'll see a great improvement with your image quality. So what happens if you don't fill out all the information at the top? Do you still have to enter it at the bottom? Absolutely. And that's why I recommend entering all that information at the top. If they need a cylinder, the software takes over and tells you which power to use. And you just check which box of the correction you're using. If you're not filling in that information, you do still need to check the box for astigmatic lenses and tell it, I used a plus two cylinder or three cell. Just by taking these few steps upon baseline, all this eye data will be saved for when your patient comes back for follow-up examinations. All right, so now you have your patient's name, date of birth, all the correct information input. Now it's time to take your image. For the camera, it's really important to keep your equipment clean at all times. I like to clean the chin rest and the head rest in front of the patient with alcohol preps. And it's also good to clean that camera lens from time to time. A nice soft microfiber lens cloth is certainly adequate for that. Just gently wipe that lens aperture starting at the center in a circular motion and work your way out. And of course you want to have your patient put their chin in the chin rest and forehead against that headrest. And then make sure they're lined up with our lateral canthus line. Then you're going to be fine tuning up and down and bringing the camera lens just outside their eyelashes about 10 millimeters just about thumb width, just outside the eyelashes. And then always begin at spherical equivalent, and you'll notice a great improvement with image quality as well. And of course, you want to discuss with your patient. Let them know what to expect. Tell them, Mrs. Smith, I promise I'm not going to blow any air at the back of your eye today. And assure your patients that you won't be 
just assure your patients everything that you're going to do to make them comfortable. And again, if they have astigmatism greater than one diopter, please correct for it. As I mentioned, we do prefer our astigmatic lenses, but you can use their glasses or contacts. And make sure that those corneas are very well hydrated. And just assure that your patient is extremely comfortable, and then get them to stare right into that red scan field, and then over towards the green blinking light towards their nose. Now this is an example of the HRT3. And this actually comes equipped with a lift now, which makes it much more utilitarian, so you can move it into a vertical position. So if you have larger patients or actually really small patients, you know how sometimes they can't lean into the system, you can either acquire the tilt or some people actually remove the screws here and put an ophthalmic PDR underneath just to put that into a vertical position. Now this is an, an image of the HRT2. This is your camera head. This is the adjustable lens for focus. So when we say bracket your focus, this is what we're talking about. And of course, this is where you're going to start at spherical equivalent for your patient. This knob adjusts the height. And these are really important. These are fine adjustment knobs of your camera. The outer control moves it right and left, and the inner control moves it up and down. And this one is probably the most important. This one moves your camera forward and back. So either have your patient sit back between eyes or move your camera back so you don't hit them in the nose. Now this is our internal fixation card, and you should have received one of these. If not, please contact me. I'd be happy to send you our internal fixation card. This just helps to show your patient what to expect. Remember in the beginning, have them look in the center of the big red scan field, and then over at the blinking fixation target towards their nose. And what I like to do, first I project the laser beam onto the iris. And you'll notice once it's on the iris, when you're pretty far away, it's going to be a very fuzzy laser beam. Once you get closer to the eye, you'll see a sharp, clear, crisp circle. And then you can move it over to the pupil. You always want to make sure that it's all the way through the center of the pupil. You don't want any crescent moon or any of the laser hanging outside the pupil. If you just think about it this way, any light that isn't through the pupil is data that you're missing. So you want to make sure that you're collecting all your data. Honestly, just by doing this alone, just getting your patient set up correctly and getting that laser to the correct distance and all the way through the center of the pupil, as in this example, you'll get a quality image about 80% of the time without doing anything else. Then once you get them lined up correctly, bracket that front objective lens. You want to bracket that focus for a nice, clear, orangish yellow color. You're actually setting it to the highest point of the retinal surface. You want a nice reflection off those blood vessels. They should be clear and crisp. You also want to make sure that you distribute that light even, evenly. You don't want any framing or vignetting over those images. And then, of course, fine tune that laser alignment. Move it up and down or left and right until you find the brightest, most evenly illuminated image. And if you have the older version of the software, you'll want to monitor the quality control bars and your sensitivity. And we're going to go over both versions of the software briefly. This is an example of version 1.7. This is the older version of the software. And both work the same in terms of imaging, but the imaging screens look just a bit different. So of course, you still see it automatically selects right eye or left eye, depending on where you have your camera. You have your quality control bars on the side and your sensitivity numbers. It'll show you the focus setting of your current exam as well as the focus setting of the last exam. If you checked corrective lenses, it'll display a warning message telling you it assumes that it should be corrected for. So really make sure that you read your warning messages and pay attention to how you enter your eye data. And just be aware of what your focus settings are. Now, this is an example of the Premium Edition software, which is version 3. Basically, basically it's the same with just a few changes. You still have your right eye, left eye option. It'll still tell you the focus of your current exam as well as the focus of your last exam. But instead of the blue quality control bars and the sensitivity numbers, it's all combined here into this live image quality bar. And this bar will go from red 
to yellow to green, with green being the optimal setting. So the longer this bar is, the better quality your image is going to be. Now, there are live camera warnings with both versions of the software. And of course, you'll always get the window that says, please set up focus on camera. That's just a quality check to assure that you are bracketing that focus to get the most optimal setting. And sometimes you might get this possible incorrect focus setting. It most often occurs in examples like this when the last exam of the, the last exam was set to minus three, and now it's set to plus five. Well, that's a difference of eight diopters and really shouldn't happen unless your patient has had some type of major eye surgery. So please do pay attention to your warning messages and just be aware of those settings to assure that you are on target. Now with the premium edition of the software, you still get your focus messages, but we have additional messages as an added benefit just to help our new operators get used to the HRT software. We have this green aiming circle where you want to center the optic nerve head. And in this example, you can see that the quality bar is red, so it's indicating that the camera was too far back. So simply checking the camera distance, bringing it forward just a bit would have resolved this issue. And the other says low image sharpness. Check your focus setting. So if you pay attention to these messages, you can almost guarantee a quality image every time. Now, once in a while, you may see uncorrected astigmatism, or too high or too deep. A lot of times, believe it or not, it's simply a soiled lens. And as you know, mascara is a culprit for smudging lenses on your phoropters. Just always assure that those lenses and astigmatic lenses for the front of the camera are spotless clean with those microfiber cloths. It could also mean that your camera is misaligned and the laser can't find the patient's optic nerve head. And if you have really small pupils, try dilating. But as you know with the HRT, you don't have to dilate. One thing to mention, though, you want to be consistent. So if you dilate at baseline, make a note, and you'll want to dilate with every exam there, thereafter. It could also mean that the astigmatism was not corrected for. So make sure you're correcting for astigmatism. But it could also mean that your patient is really too high or too deep. If you have a patient with advanced glaucoma who's really cupped out and you can see all the way down to the lamina, it really means that that patient is too deep. They're beyond that four millimeters. So you really may not be able to get an image in that case. The too high just means if you have someone with a really shallow cup or maybe they have optic nerve head drusen or papilledema, again, the laser can't find the back of the cup at all. So in those cases, just Make sure everything's clean, that you've bracketed your focus, and all your settings are correct. But just be aware, if you do have a very advanced glaucoma patient, you may not be able to get a good quality image. Just make a note for your next exam. And again, it doesn't happen very often, but I do occasionally get calls about it. All right, so next let's talk about monitoring your quality. With the older version of the software, you want to get as many blue bars as possible and keep those sensitivity numbers as low as possible. If you can only get three blue bars, that's OK. Just try the best you can for each patient. With the sensitivity numbers, you want to shoot for numbers between 65 and 80%. If you're in the 80th percentile, that's OK. But if you're up in the 90s, have your patient sit back and rest for a minute or two hydrate their corneas really well, and then try to get another image. I, I like to get the patient to blink two good times right before I hit that acquisition button. Now with the premium edition of the software, you're looking for the warning messages and this green quality control bar to be over as far as possible and as high up as close to 100% as you can. However, if it's green and only at 60% and that's the best you can do, then, then try and get that image. Just again, make sure that you've followed all the steps, making sure that their corneas are well hydrated, you've bracketed your focus, and then get them to blink a couple of good times. And when that light settles, you'll actually see that bar turn to green. So what happens if you keep getting warning messages, no matter what, and you just believe it really is a quality image? During live image acquisition mode, you can go up to Options and uncheck Autosave. The software is still going to do all those quality checks for you, but it won't keep flashing those warning messages at you. 
you can ignore them if you want, but if they're really bothering you, just again, in live image acquisition mode, go up to options on your menu bar and uncheck those. So how do you acquire an image? Well, you're either going to hit the acquisition button on the back of your camera, or you can use your foot switch. And then once you hit that button, the software takes over. You don't need to do anything at that point. The software does the fine tuning of the focus, and the sensitivity is automatic. That's where it's going to take those three to five images and save the best three. Remember, the first image is going to be at four millimeters, and then the second and third will be set to that correct depth. And you don't need to do anything about that except just make sure you have the patient lined up correctly. And then once you hit that acquisition button or your foot switch, that software will take over from there. And then once it gets the best three images, one of two things will happen. Either the laser stays on and you can move the camera to the other side, and that's with your autosave on. Or if you have your autosave off, you'll see the movie playing actually running through all those images that you just acquired. And then you have the option to save the image. And the camera actually pauses after acquisition, which I really like. In fact, I always recommend turning the autosave off because the camera does pause and gives you time to see if there was any strong eye movement or perhaps floaters obstructing that nerve. So go up to Options in the Live Imaging window and uncheck Autosave. This way, you choose which images you want to save, and you won't have to wait for all those topographies to be calculated. You'll know exactly which images you want to save, and you're not saving any poor quality images. The Auto Save Off just gives you a second chance to critically review that image before saving it. It's just a time-saving feature when you consider that you're going to be creating topographies for all the images saved, even those of bad quality. If you wait until after the patient's gone to compute those topographies and the image quality was poor, it's too late to acquire another image. So it's really important before you hit that acquisition button, look back into your patient's eye one more time and make sure that you're lined up, that that laser is entirely through the center of the pupil, and this will really help improve your image quality. Speaking of image quality, let's talk about it. After you've set up your patient and taken your beautiful HRT image, you want to review it. And the very first thing to check for is the symbol. If you've seen this, or if you see it, you want to take another image right away. This means that one of the topographies will be ignored by the progression analysis. Two were good series, and one failed. So if you see it, delete it immediately and re-image your patient. It's most often due to eye movement. So be really careful because you won't be able to use an image like this for baseline, and it won't be included in your progression analysis. If you've seen these in the past, you can exclude them and just know from here forward, if you see this symbol, please try and retake that image right away. To review the image, you want to double left click or you can right click and do show results. In the older version, you'll see the standard deviation at the top of the contour line screen. With the premium edition, you'll, you still have the standard deviation, but you now have the addition of the quality control check. If you click on the little QC button, you'll see the standard deviation and all the live checks that the new software does. You'll see if they've passed or failed, and you'll get your overall quality score. So what does that mean? Well, at the top, you have your image quality score, your imaging quality score, and then your overall score. And that's what's on the printout. So if you've ever had a really good standard deviation, such as 25, but on the printout it says poor or unacceptable, if you go up to your QC box, more times than none, you'll see that one of those checks failed, therefore giving you an overall quality score of poor. You really don't need to go to that QC box every time, but if you see something strange on your printout, check that QC box to see if any of those checks failed. And of course, I recommend trying to get another image if they did. That way, you'll get the best possible quality score. Now, the standard deviation guidelines are, of course, the lower the better. But as I said, just do the best you can for each patient. Your standard deviation is on all the printouts. And with the older software, you'll see it at the bottom of your single eye report. And if you've upgraded your glaucoma software, it will be on the top left. 
your overall quality score will say excellent, good, acceptable, and so on. So do check all of those along with your QC box. All right, so what's important here? Well, of course, you want to make sure you're consistent with your iData parameters. Make sure you're entering that corneal curvature at baseline and updating after any invasive eye surgery. Make sure to check your distance to the eye. You want to be about 10 millimeters or about a thumb width. And of course, make sure to take time and bracket that focus. I'll go back and forth sometimes. I'll try a plus three and go back to a plus two and see does that get any better or worse or even crank it up to a plus four. Just be sure that that's the best possible image you can get for your patient. And I can't stress enough how crucial it is to fine tune that laser and make sure you have it all the way through the center of the pupil. It'll really help with your even illumination and um, resolve any vignetting. And making sure you don't have any shadows, as I mentioned, vignetting are the shadows around the corners of the image. And of course, please do turn off that autosave feature if you're not already. That way you can have time to review the movie and you won't be saving any poor quality data. And of course, review your overall image quality. And most importantly, be patient for your patient. Take your time. It's important for everyone. The patient who took time out of, out of their day to be there for your doctor, and of course, your time is valuable as well. Just remember, garbage in is garbage out. Imagine your 80-year-old grandmother taking time out of her day to go to her ophthalmologist, who she's been waiting to see for six months. You'd want her to be treated with patience and also to be well informed of what's expected of her. If you get a poor quality exam, then that's all of the patient's time, the doctor's time, and your time that's wasted. If she was imaged incorrectly, then all that data is going to be invalid. So that'll be six months to a year's worth of data that's unusable. So it's really important to take those few seconds and extra steps just to assure that you improve your image quality. All right, as we wrap up, I'm just going to go over some poor quality images. And most of these are pretty obvious. Now this is an example of what an out-of-focus image looks like. And all it would take to get a clear image in this case is just to bracket that focus a couple clicks, and they would have received a nice, clear image. You want to make sure to get those vessels nice and clear and crisp. And here's another one that was out of focus. It just means that it's too deep and too dark. You don't want your image too dark. You want that nice orange-yellow color. And this is an example of what happens when you get uncorrected astigmatism. You see how the bottom portion looks like it's almost in focus and the other portion is blurry? Simply correcting for astigmatism would have resolved this issue. Just remember, if your patient has astigmatism greater than one, please be correcting for it. And you want to watch out for excessive eye movement. That's the black borders on the side of the screen. It's OK. Some patients just can't fixate or stay still. Just make sure to review your movie and make sure that optic nerve head is not jumping off the screen. Now, this one shows two optic nerve heads. And this was actually sent in for a study. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen two optic nerve heads. So just simply bracketing that focus could have helped resolve that issue. And you want to make sure you're not overexposed. This was because of the focus being set too high. It's OK to have bright white in the center, but you don't want any shadowing. You see how the top left is really bright and the bottom is actually pretty much set correctly. Just fine tuning that laser would have resolved this issue. And this was underexposure, which is the same as focusing too deep. Just make sure you come a few clicks forward and get that nice orange yellow or orangish yellow color. Now, two other things you want to look for are making sure that the optic nerve head is centered and looking out for floaters. First thing is centering. And here you have an alignment failed. Make sure you always have your patient look forward. So let's say this was baseline here. And then the follow-up, they were looking down. You can totally see why this manual alignment or the alignment failed, therefore prompting you to do a manual alignment. And here's one with an optic nerve head not centered. So if you have any part of the optic nerve head cut off, this is data that you can't analyze. So make sure that that optic nerve head is right in the center of your image. 
And the last thing to watch out for is floaters. As I'm sure you all know, floaters love to come back to that same spot. So I'll have my patients look left and right or up and down real quickly, just long enough to get that floater out of the way. But if you catch a floater over the optic nerve head like this big blob in this example, then try to re-image that patient to get all the correct data. And this is framing, which means that the camera was just a little bit too far back. So the light was just touching the edges. So what you want to do is just move that camera a little bit farther forward to avoid framing. Or you can see here it's actually hitting all the sides. So just moving it closer a little bit would have alleviated that issue. Now, this is an example of an image taken for a major study. This was taken in 1994. And here's the same patient in 1995. You can see here, this is a huge difference. And this is what I mean when I talk about checking your focus or bracketing your focus. This is an unacceptable image. And just a few clicks of the focus gave this nice, clear image. This was a waste of an entire year's worth of data for a major study due to poor quality. Your patients come in once a year or twice a year, so don't waste their time and the doctor's time by not taking your time following these simple steps. You as operators are the most important aspect of the HRT because a good image is everything. Once you have a good image and it's taken correctly, that's the best case for your patients and your doctors to be evaluate that patient. All right, so finally, we'll have our formal question and answer session. Please feel free to type any questions you may have or send me a chat message. And I'm just going to display our resource page while you're thinking of any questions you may have. I hope this course was helpful to you. And we have a question about the corneal curvature. And believe me, we get that question a lot. What is corneal curvature? Well, the way to get the case is to add the horizontal and vertical keratometry measurements, or of course that's your flat and steep keratometry readings. Add it together, divide it by two, and convert it to millimeters. And if you need a millimeter conversion chart, you can contact me. I'd be happy to provide one. Or if you have a contact lens department, then they will have one more than likely. Thank you. That was an excellent question. And another question, how many points to use for the contour lines? Well, that's an excellent question. In fact, please join me for my next course, Simple Techniques Drawing the Contour Line with the HRT. And we'll go over in detail contour line plotting. Of course, if you ever have any questions, you can contact me anytime. Just call the 800 number and press option 2. We have excellent online support at heidelbergengineering.com. You can access our clinical tools such as articles, guides, and reports. Or you can email me anytime at clinicalusa at heidelbergengineering.com. All right. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join me. I'm Eva Kroniker on behalf of all of us here at Heidelberg Engineering. For those of you on the East Coast and in the Midwest, have a wonderful evening. And for those of you here on the West Coast, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And to all of you, thank you again for joining the Heidelberg Engineering Academy.